So my research in my laboratory involves um, understanding how genes are involved in controlling developmental pathways. And then when we find those genes, ask how they're involved in, in human diseases. And what we work on is uh, pigmentation, but not what we were just talking about more like these animals that you see up here. We want to ask for genes that control patterning and, and how uh, these uh, white and black spots uh, occur uh, during development and how they're associated with disease. The idea being that if we can identify genes that disrupt these uh, cells that cause pigmentation, the melanocytes, we'll get to later, um, that they may be targets for cancer of the melanocytes, melanoma. So my work, uh, as well as work of, of many people, mostly focus on very major mutations. So mutations that disrupt the gene and result in these, these various patterns. However, when we talk about human populations, most of the mutations are, are minor mutations that have influences. Um, and in fact, uh, now, that, now human genesis have gone back and sequenced DNA from thousands of people. And when we compare this, uh, what we find out is something very interesting, which you may have heard, is that if we take any two people anywhere in the world, the percentage of our DNA that's identical is 99.9%. Now, I, I know it sounds um, um, uh, like a number, but I've always had trouble visualizing that. And so part of what I do is to try to develop new ways to do outreach. Uh, and so one of the ways I think about it is, OK, imagine two people that are as completely different that you can imagine. They um, hate each other and are constantly at war. So two people like Kanye West and Tar <laughs> Taylor Swift, their DNA is 99.9% .9 identical. And so if you want to see what that is, there's a bag here, and if there's one on my chair, if you can hand it out over there. In this bag is 5,000 beads. The red ones are what's identical between any two people in the world. It's only those few blue ones in there. That's our differences. Can you pass that one? So, from this type of analysis, um, it's clear that there's no genetic or biological basis for race. Race is real. I mean, that's why I'm scared to be here tonight to talk about it. It's definitely real. Um, but it's more of a social construct, which I'm sure we'll get to during our discussions later. OK. Um, so let's go a little bit more into our DNA and our differences when we talk about this 99.9% .9 and the 1%. So if we take a close-up look at here's an unraveled chromosome, a picture of an unraveled chromosome, the, um, uh, the sequence of nucleotides that make up DNA are just four bases, G, A, T, and C. So if we look here at one, um, it could 99% uh, of the time, it's, it's uh, the same between all of us. But sometimes there's a difference. It varies. And uh, so may, one of those bases may be an A, and one of those bases instead in someone else may be a T. And that's what we call the differences in DNA. Um, um, so where am I? OK, so let's think about it. OK, so now we have this 0.1% uh, difference between us. So of that, uh, um, about 85% of it is, uh, is uh, differences that are found among a population. And so, um, let's see. Sorry, I haven't given this talk before. Um, OK, yeah, so this 85% or so of, the, of this 0.1%, this so a very small percent, um, is the differences uh, um, uh, within uh, populations. It's only a few percent, a few thousand uh, differences out of millions that uh, are different across populations. And so these are the ones that we're talking about where we can determine someone's ancestral history. And the other thing is, of these few thousands that are differences, most of them don't really have functional um, consequences to them. I mean, they're useful for uh, tracking what continent our ancestors came from. But um, only a few of them, including ones for pigmentation, as you'll see, uh, are, are, um, are, um, have, have a, a biological function. So, and of those ones that we use for um, uh, classifying ancestral origin, it's not that one population has these differences and, and, and one doesn't. It's that um, the DNA variations are in all the populations. In fact, they all came from Africa because we started out in Africa. 
And when some of us left and migrated to other places, we took alleles, we took these differences in DNA that were present there. And as we migrated around the world, these, some of these DNA differences came with us. And so it's not that, that in one population there's an A allele and another population there's a T. It's the frequencies that are different between them. So we all have the same DNA sequence, and, and, and these populations are different by the, by the frequencies. So let's take a look. So for example, if we have uh, in one population, there may be more Ts at that spot than an A. And so another population may have equal numbers, and a third population may have or more As and more Ts. So it's not that you know, one population is completely one, one uh, variation there. It's that the frequency is different in a gradation as we travel from Africa around the world. So we don't have these blocks of DNA differences in one location and another location. So that's one of the reasons that support that there's a gradi gradation, not only of, of the DNA sequences, but many of our traits. OK, so one of these traits is pigmentation. And often when we think about it, especially in the US, we think about it in blocks, like dark skin or light skin. But actually, as, if you would really look around the world, it really is a gradation. It, 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 and even within populations that you may classify as a particular grouping, there's quite a bit of variation. Um, and one of the things that, uh, that uh, is obvious is that we use this, and it really biases our perception. And one way that I like to, to show this is this slide here. So here's a, um, a picture of uh, five boys, and they all have a mutation in, uh, in a gene that results in albinism. And so basically, we've taken away the pigment. And now we're left with looking and figuring out where these boys are from. And if you look, it's kind of hard to, to, to figure out wh where their ancestral origins are. Maybe Sweden, maybe um, Ireland. Um, but if I were to tell you that they're all from India, it might surprise you. So pigmentation really does mask our, our perceptions. OK. Well, the, the redhead one has probably had dyed hair. <laughs> and I'm not sure if he had a choice. That may have been the photographer's choice. <laughs> OK. All right. So let's take a step back now and look at what this pigmentation, really a, a, a very superficial sort of trait that doesn't correlate with other traits that you may associate, like, like hair and facial features or behavior or reading. It's pigmentation. OK? It varies around the world. We're not really sure why. Uh, it, it varies with latitude. So maybe it has something to do with protection from ultraviolet light. But let's take a look and, and talk a little bit more about pigmentation. And the way I thought I would do it, since there's a lot of artists in the room, is to compare it to um, uh, painting. Okay? So we have a canvas, we have paints, and we have brushes. So in humans, the canvas is our skin. And we heard a little bit about that. And there's two types of cells I want to mostly focus on. One are the keratinocytes in the epidermis. That's the surface of your skin. The other one is the melanocyte. That's the pigment-producing cell. And so when during gestation, those epidermal cells form on the outside of your skin, but the melanocytes don't start there. They come from the ridge of your spinal cord during development. And from there, they have to migrate throughout the entire body to populate the skin. And once they get into the skin, then they make that pigment that they transfer into your external layer. And so those animals that I showed you in the, in the beginning with the black and white spots, those have a disruption in genes that prevent the melanocytes from making it to those different areas. And so that's why my lab studies animals like that, because by finding genes that disrupt this developmental pathway, we hope that they're targets for transformed melanocytes or melanomas. OK, that's the canvas. The melanocytes make pigment. They transfer this pigment into the overlying keratinocytes. And then the keratinocytes uh, allow us to see the pigmentation. What about the pigments? Well, as an artist, you have lots to uh, choose from in order to paint your canvas. Well, in mammals and, and people, uh, we don't. We basically make two pigments. Our DNA makes two pigments. One is a reddish yellow one, and one is a, a blackish brown one. 
And so all the variation that we have in our skin is just from these two pigments. So how does we do it? How does the genome do that? How do we get this variation? Well, first of all, there's many genes involved in this. Okay, it's not just that there's one gene that makes someone have dark brown skin and one gene that makes someone have light brown skin. There's many genes, probably over 100 and maybe 10 major ones, that variations combine and interact and with additive effects to control this pigmentation pattern. And even some of these genes have more than one flavor. So um, uh, you maybe if, if you've had genetics, you hear that there's a, the capital A and the little a allele, and so there's only two alleles. Well, some genes have many alleles, and one of them is for controlling the uh, uh, red hair uh, phenotype. And in fact, there's over 90 different flavors of this gene called melanocortin-1 receptor that results in uh, modifying the amount of, of red hair. And whoops, and if we, if we look at them, uh, if we start on the right-hand uh, uh, column, these, have, these uh, alleles have low uh, activity or no activity, and they have very uh, high red hair and freckling. But as we move towards the left, the alterations in the DNA result in various functions of that gene, and we have different amounts of pigments. So just like an artist may control the amount of red by mixing two hues together, the genome can alter the amount of red by controlling the activity of this one particular gene. So, in addition, there's also many genes that are involved, I told you about, and there's multiple ways to get to one particular trait. So, for example, um, if we think about people uh, with uh, uh, dark skin from, uh, like, say, Africa, um, um, Australia, and India, the way that they get the heavily pigmented skin are by, by different mechanisms. And I want to tell you about another example, and that is white. So an artist would take a tube of white paint to, in order to make white. Well, in mammals, we, we can make it four different ways. So the animal, the, the polar bear in the upper left, he has melanocytes throughout his entire skin. He has them in his hair follicle. But what he doesn't do, he doesn't give a signal to the melanocytes in the hair follicle to make pigment. So he has white hair. His, if he shaved off that hair, his skin would be black. He's just not making white in his hair. The man on the right has, a, has melanocytes all over his body and in his hair, but he has a mutation in a gene where he can't make pigment, a type of albinism. So he has white skin because of that. The cat on the bottom right um, is white because it's missing all of the melanocytes throughout its body due to one of those mutations that I was telling you about before. And the woman on the left, she has white hair because she has grain. There's a defect in, in melanocyte stem cells. Those are cells in your hair follicle that when you're hair grows back, falls out and grows back. If you don't replace it with stem cells to make pigment, you'll have white hair or gray hair. So just like these major mutations, the same thing happens with variation in human pigmentation, that there's many genes involved and many ways to get to those traits. So it's not just one way to get dark skin or a light skin or medium skin. There's many ways to do it. So the example I want to show you here uh, uses the timeline of how we've migrated from Africa to various parts of the world. And along the bottom shows the gradation of the variation of pigment that we have across the human population. So one of the uh, uh, genes that uh, is involved in controlling pigmentation is a mutation in a gene called SLC24A5. We don't always think of interesting names for, for genes. <laughs> So the, the idea is in Europe, where they have lighter color skin, that box below it, see, there's mostly A alleles there. So that's the allele that makes lighter skin. Not everybody has it, just a higher percentage. On the left is Africa, where it's mostly the other allele. Uh, not everybody has it, just mostly people. So in Asia, where there's also lighter skin, it turns out that they look more like the distribution that we see in Africa. But their skin is much, much lighter in, in general. So what we know is that there's a different repertoire of genes that controls the lightness that we see in Asian populations versus European populations. The brushes, okay? So now I told you about canvas, I told you about the pigments, um, and uh, there's many genes involved. So how do we get this color? So what happens is, uh, if we take a look at the canvas from people throughout the world, it's the same. We have the same epidermis. We even have the same number of melanocytes. 
the same number of cells that make the pigment. The difference comes in from, e from a combination of the amount of pigment, the amount of the red pigment and or the black pigment, and the way this pigment is packaged into these little globules called granules. And you can see them here. These are close-ups of, of hair follicles. They're actually mice, but look similar in human. And so you can see that on the left, there's these large globules, and on the right, they're more speckled globules. So in more Caucasian populations, we have less overall pigment and smaller granules. So when the light hits the skin, it looks lighter. In more darker populations, we have more pigment and larger granules, and that's a, it interacts with reflectance of light. Once again, controlled by all these hundreds of genes that interact in different ways in different populations. But I told you in the beginning, it's not all about the DNA, OK? I talked about how DNA differences um, uh, cause things. But um, one way that scientists look at this is what, what, how much impact does DNA uh, variation have on traits is by looking at twins. So for example, if you have two identical twins or two fraternal twins, um, you could ask, how similar are traits? So you might think, OK, well, the DNA is identical. Everything's going to be identical about them, right? Well, not really. So if you look here, um, uh, traits like on the top here, height and pigmentation would be there. It's a very high genetic component. So green is identical twins and, and yellow is fraternal. So height has a very high genetic component, although there is environmental components as well, because we know that uh, 100 years ago, we were all quite a bit shorter. Our genes didn't change, but our diet did, right? As we go down, we have genes on the, our diseases on the bottom, like breast cancer, Crohn disease, rheumatoid arthritis, very low genetic uh, uh, um, um, component to it. So the two twins, one has it and one doesn't have it. That's not very concordant. So there's very much more of an environmental component to it. And so a lot of times, people like me that work on DNA, we try to tell you how important DNA is and DNA variations is. It's not always the case. It's not, it isn't the case. A lot has to do with the environment, where you grew up, what time in history you grew up. Um, and, um, and so what we know about DNA is we can use the sequence to determine someone's identity. We know that from forensics. But the sequence of our DNA doesn't determine either our identity or our destiny. I'll stop there.